Okay, Itayamo, welcome. Hello, everyone. <laughs> this is the final event in what we have scheduled for our Ukrainian Festival of Learning here in Wheaton Pier, um, hosted by the Holy Ghost Ukrainian Parish. Members of whom are gathered here today uh, in partnership with the Center for Sound Communities. It's been quite a ride in the wake of a hurricane and um, with many goings on. Um, it's been a, a really wonderful opportunity to learn together through a series of workshops and, and talks. And this is the final of these, uh, our Thursday night talks. Um, I'd like to uh, deliver a brief land acknowledgement if I may. So my name is Marcia Ostashevsky. I'm the founding director of the Center for Sound Communities. I'm um, uh, of Ukrainian ancestry. My ancestors came from what is today Ukraine to the Western part of Canada, what's Treaty 6 territory. And here in the Holy Ghost Ukrainian Parish and Cape Breton University, we are in Unamagi, part of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral lands and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. It's covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, first signed by the British Crown in 1725. And it acknowledged that Mi'kmaq and Molossia uh, peoples, um, that these were their ancestral lands, and also that we were to live in friendship and cooperation um, with Indigenous peoples. And so I ask that we all bring our best selves tonight. Uh, I know that earlier this morning, and all through the day, I think people were bringing their best selves to some pirohen making. Um, so uh, I think people have been very busy. Um, and um, and today, uh, then if it's okay with Cassandra, we'll get started with her talk. Uh, I'm really delighted to introduce uh, this talk tonight uh, with Dr. Cassandra Lutsiuk, who is a relatively new professor. And, uh, and I'm hoping we can woo her to these parts um, as a historian, I think she has much to offer this community, uh, and it's one reason why we've invited her here today. Um, Cassandra is teaching now at Dalhousie University. She studied history, Canadian history, migration and ethnicity, law and human rights, and social and political movements, um, particularly in the Ukrainian diaspora at Queen's University and then the University of Toronto. One of her uh, most recent publications is an article called They Will Crack Heads When the Communist Line <coughs> is Expounded, Anti-Communist Violence in Cold War Canada in a journal uh, called Labour. Um, but she's also won the Kobzar Book Award, or rather so she shortlisted, which in my view is, is quite a prize in itself, for the Kobzar Book Award, Studies in Ukrainian Culture and History, for a book called Enemy Alien, A True Story of Life behind barbed wire. And so this focuses on internment. Um, Cassandra, it's my understanding, will begin her talk today um, with some history of internment. I know that that's something um, that the parish has engaged in conversation before. In fact, with her father who visited the parish, there's a picture of her father and Father Roman as we enter the church uh, upstairs. Um, but she'll have more to, to say um, with respect to how the internment is part of the settler colonialism, uh, kind of more broadly, as far as I underwear, understand. Oops, sorry. Um, are we okay with the password? Someone's trying to gain access to the password. Um, okay. okay. Uh, so, um, Cassandra, is this now a good time to turn things over to you? Sounds great. Yeah. So we welcome you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Cassandra. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, just to kind of keep the focus on the screen, I'm actually going to just turn off my video um, and push this up to the top because it's blocking quite a bit of my screen. Okay. Hopefully that you can all see everything now clearly. Um, so yeah, once again, thanks for having me here today. Uh, it's really, it's, I'm sad I'm not there in person, but uh, but yes, I will eventually take you up on your offer to be there in person. I'm really excited about that potential and I'm looking forward to that. Um, 
So I want to try to accomplish uh, several interconnected things with my time today. Um, what I want to do first is to talk a little bit about the history of Ukrainian internment during the First World War. Um, and then I want to use this as a bit of a jumping off point uh, for thinking about the forging of a political consciousness within the Ukrainian Canadian community. And more importantly, for thinking about the obligations of our community for advancing reconciliation today. So for some of you, this probably will not be anything new, uh, but just as a quick overview, of course, in 1914, the First World War breaks out. Um, this is really a global conflict with a multitude of triggers that divides the world into two opposing camps. Uh, we've got the so-called allied powers. Um, they're highlighted in green on the top image here. Um, its main players include uh, Britain, France, and Russia. Um, and then they're sort of in opposition to uh, the so-called central powers. So Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, um, and they're highlighted uh, in orange. Uh, Canada doesn't have a whole lot to do with the outbreak of the war, uh, nor does it have much say over whether it goes to war, um, and this is because at the time Canada uh, is a dominion of Britain, um, and you can see the kind of um, uh, dominions and sort of um, and remnants of the British Empire there on the screen in blue and red. Um, so when Britain goes to war, Canada is automatically at war too. This doesn't mean that Canadians oppose the war effort. Uh, to the contrary, in fact, Canadians overwhelmingly do. Uh, much like the war itself, this is for a multitude of reasons. Um, but one of the aspects that is most relevant uh, for us today is a really effective propaganda campaign that's leveled by the Canadian state and its supporters in the ruling kind of Anglo elite. Um, and you can see some examples of this kind of propaganda um, on the screen here. Now, there's certainly an argument to be made, uh, you know, that that propaganda is useful for wartime mobilization, uh, you know, to use a very contemporary example, uh, we're witnessing a very effective campaign of what we call um, positive propaganda in Ukraine today, where the Ukrainian government uh, is involved in a very sophisticated utilization um, of like good news stories and sort of positive morale boosting stories. Um, to sort of get folks kind of, you know, not just not just soldiers, but the but the sort of civilian population more generally to sort of get folks behind um, the war effort. And again, it's very successful. Um, and it's, you know, um, you know, as a Ukrainian, I'm sure we can all agree, we're sort of happy to see it. But in the case of Canada during the First World War, um, you know, firstly, this wasn't positive propaganda. Um, it promoted very negative stereotypes about ethnic migrants, um, particularly Germans, as you can see on the screen here, but also others who came from countries or empires who are now at war with the Allies. And the ultimate goal of this propaganda was to shape public opinion um, in order to make people, you know, dislike, distrust, and or fear migrants. And we call the manifestations of this xenophobia. Secondly, the consequences of this propaganda aren't affecting the government or the state uh, of belligerent nations, but who it does hurt are the migrants on the receiving end, right? Despite there being basically no instances of disloyalty for them, um, this kind of, the, the consequences of this propaganda really target people um, on the ground. This, of course, trickles down to Ukrainians. Uh, we have to remember that in 1914, of course, Ukraine as we know it today um, didn't exist. Its territory was split between the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, give or take. Um, and what this means is that many people who may have held uh, local, regional, or um, I, I guess in some way national identities that are now associated with Ukraine, right, people who might have considered themselves uh, to be Bukovinian or Galician, for example, they were technically classified as uh, either Russians or Austro-Hungarians. Um, and the problem, as we've kind of already discussed a little bit, the problem with being classified as Austro-Hungarian is that Austro-Hungary is fighting against the British and by extension, Canada. So this is where the problem lies, right? Ukrainian migrants in Canada are technically the subjects of a belligerent nation. And this puts a huge target 
on their backs, transforming them into quote unquote dangerous foreigners and enemy aliens who needed to be watched, policed, and disciplined. Again, it didn't really seem to matter that there was no serious evidence of their disloyalty to Canada, nor did it seem to matter that Ukrainians had no loyalty to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? Citizenship and nationality don't necessarily include one's consent. Um, and we can return to this point later in more detail, but I think it's important to state now that, you know, for the Ukrainians in the room, we really need to think about this, right? One's citizenship and one's nationality do not necessarily involve your consent. Between learning more about internment and the unique placement of Ukrainians and the kind of hierarchies of Anglo supremacy in the early 20th century, uh, the history of Ukraine, right, whose fate really since its inception has been one of conquest and dispossession, and the contemporary Russian invasion, I imagine that it's already easy for a lot of us to imagine what it must feel like to be victims of imperialism and to have a national identity imposed on you without your consent and even if it is not how you identify. So one of the things that I want us to really think about uh, today is how this acknowledgement can form the roots of our solidarity with Indigenous peoples. And also to think about what responsibilities we have, you know, as a community bearing our own scars of imperialist and colonialist policies, while also being settlers on indigenous land and contributing, you know, willingly or unwillingly to the advancement of the settler colonial project. Now, in the early days of the First World War, repression of Ukrainians is largely contained to the so-called private sphere. Um, and what I mean by this is that you know, yes, at the highest level, the state is pushing propaganda that promotes xenophobia. But it's other Canadians that are doing a lot of the discriminating. Um, we see, for example, the rise of uh, patriotic dismissals, wherein Ukrainians were collectively fired from their jobs by their bosses who didn't want, uh, quote unquote, you know, enemy aliens working for them. Eventually, though, for a number of reasons, this repression becomes a bit more formalized and concentrated in the hands of the state. Uh, Ukrainians, whom the government uh, believes might be or might start you know, causing trouble. Uh, a lot of them are deported. Uh, politically active Ukrainians, uh, specifically those Ukrainians who are active on the political left, are harassed by police uh, and the security service. Legislatively, the government also now mandates that Ukrainians need to register with their local police and check in uh, on set schedules, so kind of like an almost like a parole system. Um, also, in the legislative sphere, we see the passing of a piece of legislation known as the War Measures Act. Uh, the War Measures Act, its mandate is a lot broader than, than just policing Ukrainians, of course. Um, in fact, its, its broader purpose was to give the federal government um, a, 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 whole, a whole bunch of extra powers during times of war or invasion or insurrection. Um, and this could be either real or apprehended. In practice, what this means is that the cabinet, right, as in the, the prime minister and their ministers, um, can actually bypass parliament, um, so the House of Commons and the Senate, in order to pass laws and regulations. So in normal times, if the government wants to pass a law, essentially it goes before parliament, the law is debated, it goes to the Senate, it goes back to parliament, it's either passed or not. But under the War Measures Act, the regular rule of law is suspended and the government simply writes legislation and it becomes the law of the land. And none of this, by the way, has to be public. One of the um, darkest legacies of the War Measures Act is that it provides the legal mandate to open 24 internment camps across the country uh, beginning in late 1914. And you can see the locations of some of these camps, uh, or sorry, rather all of these camps um, on the screen now. Um, so we've got receiving stations, permanent internment camps, um, various road building and land clearing projects uh, where internees worked, um, and camp construction sites as well here uh, laid out on this map. 
In total, just over 8,500 people are interned, the vast majority of whom are Ukrainian. Now, there were, of course, more than 8,500 Ukrainians in Canada uh, in 1914. Uh, we know there are about 170,000 Ukrainians already in the country. So what accounts for this discrepancy? What actually punches someone's ticket for internment? What separates someone who might just be treated with suspicion or be forced to register or you know, face discrimination from their neighbors and their bosses? What separates those people from someone who actually ends up in a camp? So there are a few kind of macro observations that we can make and that historians have postulated about um, over time. Um, so first and foremost, internment targeted men. Um, there were some women and children in the camps, um, but they weren't themselves uh, the targets. You can see a few uh, women and children here on the screen. Um, Women and children, generally speaking, they were dependents of male internees and kind of collateral damage, uh, so to speak. Internment was largely an urban phenomenon. Um, it was very much so rooted in, in class or in socioeconomic status. Um, so internees were almost exclusively drawn from the ranks of Canada's highly exploited migrant working class, uh, which was concentrated in, of course, industrial centers. Internment also targeted the politically active. Uh, and again, I mentioned this earlier, but specifically those on the political left. Um, most of these folks found themselves rounded up after participating in unemployment strikes and riots or for distributing seditious literature. But the more specific reasons why someone might be interned, right, the kind of reason that might be given on their intake papers, um, this varied greatly. Some people were interned simply because they looked suspicious. Um, this is a way of criminalizing ethnicity and race. Uh, and there are many contemporary examples I'm sure you can all think of where one's appearance is deemed, uh, quote unquote, suspicious and therefore a criminal. Um, others were arrested for trying to cross the border. In most cases, um, border crossing was uh, because people were so destitute that they were they were trying to cross into the states to look for work. Um, a small minority were also interned because they failed to register with the government or they didn't check in frequently enough uh, or they forgot to check in altogether. Conditions in the camps were quite poor. Um, early arrivals uh, were forced to build their own prisons. Uh, they were fed starvation diets rather frequently. Um, they were often beaten and abused. Uh, they were also forced uh, to work, usually on so-called nation building projects. So doing things like clearing land, uh, building railway, uh, building roads, mining, et cetera. Beginning in 1916, um, some in internees were uh, quote unquote paroled, and I use that term lightly. Um, what this really means is that they were sold to private companies to fill wartime labor shortages. Um, and these companies often held internees against their will. Um, and they would, of course, pay them very little. Sometimes they weren't paid at all. Um, these paroled internees were often held long after the end of the war because they were seen by these, you know, private business uh, businesses as cheap disposable sources of labor. Um, in fact, this was quite a common practice in Sydney, uh, Nova Scotia. The Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation, or DOSCO, took advantage of this policy. Uh, we know that they held on to some of their internees uh, all the way into the mid-1920s and then only released them from, um, from this system. Uh, because many of them tried uh, to get involved in uh, labor organizing and industrial action. So that's the only reason they were let go. Um, here on the screen, you can see a bit of this kind of intense uh, labor regime in the camps, by the way. Now, the larger significance of these nation building projects is that, simply put, it's unreconstructed settler colonialism at work. Right. Internment is intimately connected 
with other processes that are occurring in Canada at the same time. A really great example of this uh, is the Kappas Gasing Camp. Um, that's the camp I've done the most work on. Um, Kappas Gasing sat at this really important juncture between existing settlements in Southern and Eastern Ontario. And then of course, Winnipeg in the West, which was the Chicago of the North at that time. So the government forcibly dispossesses indigenous communities from the land. Um, this is the traditional territory of the Cree and the Ojibwe peoples. Um, and it's then trying to figure out how to populate this space with settlers in order to start fueling capitalist accumulation. And what the government learns is that this is actually very difficult to do. Um, very few settlers willingly wanted to move to Kappas Gasing and the surrounding area. Um, at the time, most of this region was still very heavily forested, um, so it was quite a bit isolated, um, and no one there really knew what kind of crops they could grow, right? The region is called the clay belt for a reason, so it was risky in that sense as well. So what the government does is it takes advantage of having this captive population of internees to do the work of clearing the land and bringing it up to settler standards. So internees worked in an experimental farm where they tested crops, uh, they helped build the railway and roads, they provided essential uh, services like firefighting before a force was established and so on. In other camps, we can see further examples of this. Um, internees held in the Rockies, for example, in, in Alberta, uh, did a lot of the same work that I just mentioned, uh, but they also worked on private projects like building the golf course in Banff. Um, I'm sure that if, if um, you know, if you were interested in, in sort of thinking more about internment um, for your exhibit, you could also find very similar evidence um, of this kind of, these kinds of nation building projects occurring in uh, the camps in Halifax and Amherst, um, as well as in sites where internees were paroled to, like, uh, like the aforementioned DOSCO. So internment as a forced labor project served as a vanguard for colonialism that wouldn't have otherwise been economically feasible. The really dark part of this was that internees were unwittingly participating uh, in this while also being forced to fuel an economic system that looked to turn land into profit. And all of this was, again, against their will. This is part of the complicated legacy of internment. Um, and it's something to keep in mind uh, as well when thinking about uh, our obligations as Ukrainians for advancing reconciliation. And I just wanna quickly share this. Um, this is an internee artifact um, that came out of the Kappas Gasing camp. So it kind of hints at um, the kind of uh, internee indigenous relationship. Uh, we know that there were some interactions uh, that were taking place here. And this artifact gives us um, gives us a pretty big, pretty uh, big green light um, that that was in fact the case. Now, by and large, internees responded to, um, you know, these poor conditions in the camp and the kind of forced labor regime that they were participating in um, with tremendous resistance. Uh, for example, in the Kappas Gasing camp, internees actually dug an escape tunnel. Um, they, were, they were caught before they were able to use it, but they got very close. Um, there was also almost never ending protest, uh, including work slowdowns um, and sabotage. So for example, internees would break their tools. Um, there were sometimes even full blown riots. The tendency towards uh, resistance uh, stemmed from the fact that most internees were again, drawn from the ranks of the migratory industrial proletariat and had participated in uh, left-wing politics, so socialist politics, um, for most of their lives. Um, in fact, there were lots of opportunities for radicalization in the camps. Um, labor organizers who had been interned worked skillfully to help coalesce the ethnic and class interests of the internees and to situate their incarceration within its appropriate economic, racial, and geopolitical context. 
And as a result, many internees came to see their experiences less as an anecdotal expression of xenophobia and more as a symptom of a larger system that exploited migrant bodies to build the Canadian nation state without ever letting them then join it as equal citizens. So for internees, the act of internment, while obviously, you know, very traumatic, wasn't an isolated incident in their lives. You know, whether they were behind barbed wire or not, they saw their lives in Canada as being exceptionally difficult. You know, yes, internment was significant because for many, it represented a turning point for realizing that the promises of liberal democracy didn't apply to them. But as they continued on, they came to understand internment not as an outlier, but as being rather emblematic of this larger unjust system. And this kind of resistance was often at great personal cost to them. Um, guards would almost immediately put internees on a bread and water diet. Um, they'd lock them up in ancillary barracks or sheds away from the rest of the camp. Um, and they were usually held here in isolation until they renounced their cause. Resistance was sometimes futile. In total, we know that 107 internees died trying to escape uh, from work-related injuries uh, by suicide or from infectious disease. Uh, you know, we're still living through COVID right now, uh, but in 1918, the Spanish flu is ravaging much of the world, um, including the camps where it makes its way uh, in through infected guards. Internment does eventually end, uh, the last camp closes in 1920, uh, well after the end of the war. Um, but this isn't the end of the story. I already mentioned how some internees are held as forced laborers by private companies. Others are deported straight from the internment camps back to Europe. And while others yet may not have faced uh, further material consequences, they were psychologically shattered by what had happened to them. And um, there's a really famous quote by an RCMP informant in 1940 who says that Ukrainians continued to live in fear of the barbed wire fence. So this really gives you a sense of the kind of internee psyche. Um, and we can only imagine what this led to, you know, whether it be someone anglicizing their name and trying to assimilate um, and strip away their Ukrainianness, uh, or maybe, you know, it, it forced someone uh, or triggered someone to become uh, disillusioned and in turn radicalized by the experience. Now, beginning in the 1980s, internment began receiving attention not only from Ukrainian Canadians, but from the public at large. And what eventually happens is that a group of community activists are able to secure redress and compensation from the Canadian government. Um, and this leads to a number of important community projects, um, including some that I, I, I know have made their way uh, to your community um, based on uh, Marcia's earlier comments. And, you know, I'm sure we can all agree that this is this is great. Um, you know, it's it's fantastic to see historical wrongs being illuminated and addressed in some capacity. So it's fantastic. But at the same time, um, there are some problems with the narrative that emerged from the redress campaign. In some sense, historical accuracy in the way that, you know, historians might deal with it gets a bit sidelined in favor of creating a narrative for public consumption. Now, part of this is simply good strategy, right? These activists made deliberate and strategic decisions about how to package internment in order to procure said redress and compensation. And those of you who are going to be actively involved um, in, in, uh, in this project and in creating your own public histories through the exhibit um, will know or will learn that it's really important to create concise, clear, 
easily consumable and palatable messaging when you're doing public facing work that's going to impact how people view the topic and your message. But in this case, it went a bit beyond that. Um, and that's for a few reasons. So for one, at the time that redress is being negotiated and, and is secured, um, Canada has a federal conservative government who is interested in offering the community compensation. Um, you know, this is simply good brokerage politics. You play nice with your constituents or with ethnic communities as a whole who are then going to vote for your party. But while the conservatives are open to redress, they're not necessarily open to the community talking about internment in specific ways. In other words, they don't really want Ukrainians to talk about the systemic ideologies and policies that caused internment. So things like racism and xenophobia, political repression, capitalist accumulation, settler colonialism. As far as the feds were concerned, Internment was to be presented as a one-off mistake rooted firmly in the past that they could apologize for and move on from, right? Its essence was not, in their minds, something that continued on uh, in policies towards other migrant, racial, or ethnic groups. Now, I can't say whether community activists, you know, who were involved in, in redress were, were comfortable with this. Some were, you know, certainly happy for the victory and kind of recognized the strategic value and not poking the bear. Others, however, were certainly fine going along uh, with this kind of simplified narrative, whether that be because it aligned with their own ideological proclivities or they weren't giving it sort of a, any sort of larger thought. Um, you know, I don't want to sort of offend anyone here, but it's, uh, you know, no surprise that the Ukrainian Canadian community trends a little bit more conservative, both small and C, uh, small and big C. Um, and so frankly, there was a kind of um, a bit of a disinterest and whether that was deliberate or not, um, in sort of thinking through the way that internment might have intersected with these larger issues of racism or, again, settler colonialism or critiques of capitalism that tend to be dismissed by those on the political right more generally. And relatedly, it's important to point out that historically, the community was intensely divided along political lines. Um, and and Marcia and I have been talking a little bit about uh, the potential of maybe coming back um, and having me talk about uh, my work on the kind of left-right split in the community, but we'll save that for another day. But to make a long story short, Ukrainians in Canada historically kind of fell into one of two camps, right? Either the left or the right, or the communists or the nationalists, right? And earlier, I alluded to the fact that the majority of internees were leftists. Um, and this is not something that the community activists who are leading the charge for redress necessarily want to draw attention to, not only because it could bolster their ideological opponents, but also because if it's publicly identified that the majority of internees were leftists, why would the redress activists and their community organizations be the ones receiving the compensation from the government? So there's a bit of a vested interest in having a redress narrative that is told in a particular less political way. So what we see emerge from the redress campaign is, is something that historians call ethnic particularism, where an internment isn't really presented in context or as a symptom of a larger accumulation of problems, but rather as a specific attack or as an exclusive discrimination against Ukrainians and Ukrainians alone. You often hear the line repeated that Ukrainians were interned not because of anything they had done, but simply because of where they came from. And over time, this has been repeated so much so that it's become the primary or dominant way through which our community understands internment. So it's seen now, you know, internment seen now as an anti-Ukrainian act. Now, it goes without saying that this is a little bit problematic. Um, at the very least, right, internment doesn't just target Ukrainians. They're clearly the majority of internees, but there are others as well. And yes, internment was a project fueled in large part by xenophobia and racism towards Ukrainians, 
But the tagline of Ukrainians being interned simply because of where they came from doesn't actually address this. To the contrary, it's drawing a perimeter or a space of exceptionality around Ukrainians. So it's something akin to saying that internment was a uh, deliberate act against Ukrainians because the government hated them specifically for being Ukrainian, which again, ignores the much broader context, um, but which plays very well into the community's existing political and cultural psyche. So it fueled a bit of a, of a, a bit of a selfishness within the community. Instead of trying to push further and think bigger and being more open to solidarity with other victims of xenophobia and racism and exploitation and colonialism, the community for a long time had this really insular, individualized, and reactionary bootstraps argument that encouraged seeing internee suffering as unique and more significant than other similar instances. This was a kind of we had it first, or we had it bad too, or we had it the worst type of thinking. Or even that because we were successful in securing redress, we got ours. So the problem solved and we can end the discussion here. You know, what happens to others is not our problem anymore. Thankfully, this is starting to somewhat change and the community is getting a bit better at looking outwardly and thinking about internment as part and parcel of Canada's longstanding and unjust treatment towards those that it deems as undesirable others. But we have to keep in mind that this is a very recent phenomenon and certainly wasn't the case in the heyday of redress. So at the very basic level, when approaching the development of our own political consciousness, we should keep this in mind and work towards opening ourselves up to forging these important connections with other communities, and particularly for our purposes today when approaching reconciliation. And this kind of expansion of our thinking is in line with what the internees would have wanted of us as a community. Um, again, one of the one of the things that the redress campaign was able to do was that it, it was able to kind of craft the narrative on its own because there was very little primary source evidence available. A lot of documents were destroyed by the government in 1954. Um, and then by the time that folks began talking openly about this episode, most uh, people who had lived through it had already passed away. So again, the kind of redress activists were able to speak on behalf of the internees when establishing uh, their narrative. In my own research, I've been able to uncover some firsthand accounts of internment um, that confirm that this is not something the internees would have agreed with. Um, I've been doing a lot of work recently on, on recovering uh, stories from uh, Fort Henry internment camp in Kingston, um, but I'll, I'll tell you um, some, some of the sort of um, the stories of an internee uh, who makes up the, the um, he, he becomes the protagonist, I'll just put it that way, of Enemy Alien. Um, so he uh, talks about how when he arrived in Canada in 1912, um, he was put in an immigration shed and held there until he was able to pay a $25 fee, which of course he was not able to pay. Um, so his only choice was to be uh, bailed out, so to speak, by a private company who agreed, agreed to pay his fee in exchange for his labor. Um, and if you didn't accept such an offer, you were deported. Um, this was the fate of a lot of, of uh, Ukrainians who filed into Canada's industrial centers in the early 20th century. Uh, those who ended up in the West uh, didn't do all that much better. Um, they were given parcels of land, but the work was exceptionally grueling and very rarely rewarding. Um, given that they were often offered the worst land, of course, some were able to make it work. Um, but these stories uh, are often uh highlighted and, and given uh, they were they're kind of romanticized a little bit. Uh, and we forget about all the Ukrainians who are not able to make it work. Um, then in 1930, following the outbreak of the Great Depression, 
many uh, Ukrainians in the prairies couldn't afford to keep up. So trust companies took their land and tens of thousands of Ukrainians ended up destitute, uh, joining the ranks of those already in uh, the industrial centers. Uh, the internee uh, that Enemy Alien focuses on then spent years traveling across the country looking for work. Uh, he talks about going to Sudbury to try to get a job with uh, the International Nickel Company, or INCO, because they were promising um, their workers $6 uh, dollars for an eight-hour day. Um, this actually turned out to be a scam, and INCO used the high interest in the work uh, as a way to drive down wages. Uh, high unemployment you know, makes it really difficult to advocate for a better wage because you're seen as expendable. There's always someone there to replace you. So all of this is to say, again, right, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but to reiterate that, you know, for internees, internment, it was not an isolated incident in their lives, right? Um, again, they saw their lives in Canada um, as exceptionally difficult, and they became disillusioned with this idea that, you know, liberal democracy was going to protect them. They came to understand that internment wasn't this outlier incident, but rather it was emblematic of this unjust system. So to conclude, um, I've talked a bit about the history of internment and kind of used it as a, as a jumping off point for us to not only think about our collective political consciousness as Ukrainians, but also as people who are interested in engaging in reconciliation. We as Ukrainians uh, are a very patriotic bunch, and rightfully so. Um, our ancestors and maybe even some of your own immediate families have been granted refuge in Canada uh, for over 100 years now. This is certainly the case with my own family, so there's a lot to be grateful for. Um, but this isn't mutually exclusive with recognizing darker moments in Canada's past. And the hesitation to kind of go there and to swallow some difficult pills and to challenge or unsettle our previous, uh, previously kind of preconceived rosy notions of Canada is something that we really need to shake. I'll be very frank about this, right? Our community can't be one that promotes triumphalist and celebratory narratives of settler colonialism or that undermines the efforts of other communities who are pushing for recognition, for justice, for redress, or for an apology of their own. This betrays the reality that the very same ideologies and systems that facilitated internment still operate today in Canada and are actively being used against others. So in your own community discussions uh, and in your exhibit building and in your knowledge mobilization, forge connections between internment and other histories. Recognize this as a systemic issue and harness this to shape your approach towards contemporary issues involving communities who really need our solidarity. This is really, I think this is the only way to truly learn and apply the lessons from our history. So I'll leave it there. Uh, I'll turn the floor over back to Marcia. Sandra, could I ask a, a question just to elucidate something, a point you made? Can you explain what happened in 1954 that many documents were destroyed? Well, uh, there's actually someone here in the chat that could probably do a better job at that than I. Um, uh, pan um, but it's 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 unclear uh, what exactly happened. There's kind of two competing arguments. One is that the government simply needed space; that there was the 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 collection just took up too much space, and they had to get rid of it. And this was a normal administrative procedure where documents needed to get cleared out, and they were believed to be of no value, and so they they sort of made the cut to get thrown out. 
Um, others have said that this was a bit more conspiratorial um, and that this might have had something to do with the fact that there was already um, conversations being had about, particularly amongst the Japanese Canadian community, um, that they were going to um, start lobbying the government for redress. And so there was an effort to delete these records to stop any further um, claims being made from communities. Again, I think you know, option one is probably more realistic, but both have been said. Father Roman has a question. Just uh, remind me, did Austro-Hungary encompass all of Ukraine or just Western Ukraine? Just not, not, not Ukraine in its entirety. Yeah, no, the, the territory was divided up. The Russian Empire had parts of it as well. And then... So the, those that came from Eastern Ukraine, from the Little Ukraine, they were not part of the internment because they didn't hold Austro-Hungarian passports. So or there were, yeah, that's a great question. So there were some folks who were interned as Russians. Um, and within that, you know, the, the argument's been made that there were, of course, certainly some Ukrainians amongst that bunch, um, but not, of course, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't systemic in the same way that it would have been if you were from Western Ukraine and carried an Austro-Hungarian passport. Were Germans interned? Sorry? Were, were Germans, Germans interned? interned? Yes, Germans were interned. They were mostly first class prisoners, so they were often kept separately from the second class internees, which were primarily, you know, Ukrainians and others. Uh, but they were, yes, they were absolutely interned. And how does Canada justify or explain uh, with World War I ending in, 20, in 1919 and the last internment camp didn't close until 1922, uh, especially the ones out west and Banff and uh, Jasper areas. Uh, that's three years after the war, there's still forced labor. Is that mentioned? Is that acknowledged? Is that so? A few reasons one was simply bureaucratic delay, things have to wind down, so you know. The war ends, but you have to sort of slowly unravel these things. You have to figure out what you're doing with your internees. So there were um, deportation campaigns that had to be organized. You had to figure out where you were sending people back to. This process was even more complicated when it came to first class prisoners, some more traditional prisoners of war. There's an entire protocol that you had to follow. So part of this was simply normal end of war bureaucratic delays. Part of this was also that there's a second wave of internment that starts, uh, nine, well, I mean, it, it, it really is, an, um, it's, it's, it starts after the so-called workers revolt. So after the Winnipeg general strike in 1919, a second wave of internees are brought into the camps. These are mostly very explicitly political prisoners. Um, so anyone who was engaged in the labor movement and the sort of socialist left, um, a lot of them were brought in in 1919. And again, the government has to then figure out what to do with them. Um, so the, the war is ending. So the war has either, it's about to end or has ended when they start getting rounded up and thrown in the camps. And so that's another um, cog in the wheel that the government has to figure out. And then of course, there is this added benefit that you mentioned, which is that for some of the internees, they weren't necessarily interned anymore. They had been paroled. Um, and so they were now under the charge of these private businesses who were holding them and could kind of technically hold them uh, for a long while past the end of internment because the, the government's not, it's not their top priority to sort of figure out how to get those internees out of, uh, out of their, their grip. So it's a few different reasons. Uh, World War II, Japanese internment camps. Same uh, milk as the First World War, or were they different? Uh, same, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Same spaces? Same milk, same intention, same uh, problems, same issues as the, the First World War interpret camps, or? Generally speaking, yes. Or? Yeah, generally speaking, yes. These were, you know, um, 
enemy aliens from belligerent nations, uh, lots of uh, stoking of xenophobia and racism. So same concepts, um, lots of economic benefits as well for interning Japanese Canadians. Uh, many of them lived on the coast, uh, had established, um, you know, uh, significant businesses, seizing their property uh, was economically beneficial. Uh, it would also benefit the kind of xenophobic, you know, Anglo population who was against them. So that's certainly part of it. Um, we know, of course, that there were Italian Canadians interned, many for um, having allegedly fascistic sympathies. And we know that uh, communists were also interned as well. So political repression uh, is another consistent theme. Um, uh, Cassandra, I'm just going to ask uh, folks who are joining us online to uh, consider raising their hands if they have a question, and, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, invite you to field them. But uh, before we kind of cede the floor here, I just wanted to share with you a couple of comments, if I may. Um, the narrative, I, I have to say, I'm absolutely thrilled to hear what you shared with us today for so many reasons, um, but certainly the ways in which you speak back to uh, the narratives that were constructed and we and you spoke very eloquently about the reasons why the, those things were done in addition to of course Ukrainians trying to find a place for themselves in, in what is Canada right um, and uh, as an ethnographer uh, I especially you know now working in academia for 25 years um, my my focus has always been, uh, you know, with people, their experiences, their very personal stories and experiences in relation to all of these issues, histories, national narratives, and so forth. Um, and so my work has been to complicate those overly drawn narratives, the ones that dismiss, um, you know, women in many cases, people who just don't fit the narratives for whatever reason. Um, and so when you know, when we've talked at different conferences or people have talked to me about Ukrainian internment and the narratives that you described today, uh, you know, my first comment has been about how, in fact, they weren't interned because they were Ukrainians. They were interned because they had Austro-Hungarian passports, although it's a bit more complicated than that, too. I did want to share with you, as I say, just before we see the floor, um, that when I started doing deep historical research here in 2010, one of the um, old books that we came across, kind of an album put together about the history here, um, was basically the writing down of an oral history, uh, an account um, that was given by a priest who had visited Ukrainian internees who were interned near Marble Mountain on Unamagi, Cape Breton Island. And you mentioned the companies that they were interned by, right? Um, and the priest was went to them and said, "You know, you're Ukrainians. You all you need to do is say you're Ukrainians, and they will let you go." And uh, and and this, th what the priest said was that these internees said to him, "We made an oath before God to Franz Josef." the Austro-Hungarian emperor, emperor. We cannot break that oath or God will send us to hell. To me, that is such a deeply, uh, like a painful story. I can imagine, right? These men in these camps suffering these conditions and their oath is tied to these strong faith <laughs> beliefs um, that then, you know, it, these stories become so much more personal then, don't they? So your, your story, the enemy alien, I, I just like to hear what you think of that and, and then perhaps move on to questions from those online. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, what that indicates is that it's just such a internment with such a diverse experience and different people experienced it differently. There were certainly some Ukrainians who probably would not have, like, you know, the ones that, that you're mentioning, who would have consumed that kind of um, imperial identity, right? And then there were others who um, sort of 
took their experiences and sort of politicized them. There were some who just kept their heads down. There were some who were angry, some who were not. It's it's such a, there's so many different stories that unfortunately we're not really able to tell because we don't have the sources and you know the firsthand accounts are so few and far between. Um, you know, even like th I've been finding some things recently um, out, out here in, in Nova Scotia um, from a camp guard who uh, was stationed at Fort Henry and then in Kapuskasing. And, you know, even those stories of a, of a camp guard, they, they reveal so much about the internees themselves, but still not enough. So I think, yeah, there's just this diversity of experiences that have been a little bit flattened by the way that we tell this story. And, you know, for some reason, that's fine because you again consumable palatable but in 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 other ways it's it's too bad really because i think it's just so much more of a complicated tale than 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 it's presented as so um yeah i certainly think that that's um that that's a, an interesting thing i'd be uh, i'd be interested in learning more about uh, about that priest yeah we will engage for sure I, I do have another comment but i i don't know if you have questions from others to take i i think it's okay go ahead yeah yeah, just to say that, you know, we're here in what's known as the Whitney Pier neighborhood. Um, it's still referred to as the place where foreigners live. It's also still called the League of Nations, um, sometimes the melting pot, although that doesn't really speak to the diversity here. Um, I've lived in uh, every single region of this country and, you know, on islands off both ends, just not in the farthest north. Um, and and engage with Ukrainian communities in all of these different places. Um, in all of these different places, Ukrainians have, uh, and maybe it has to do with numbers, maybe it has to do with other political or economic uh, uh, kind of factors, but there is a place that Ukrainians occupy still as a minority culture. I mean, I marched with my mom as a four-year-old from you know, the little school in Lamont to the town hall and argued for Ukrainian bilingual language. I mean, that was something we had to do to advocate for that. But, um, but there is a place, there's a way. And I think that the redress, the history of redress speaks to this relationship between federal and provincial governments today in places like Alberta, especially where there's a strong relationship between Ukrainians and governments, right? That doesn't exist the same way in Sydney, Cape Breton at all. Um, and in fact, um, you know, the hegemony here, right? You, you could say that there that Ukrainians occupy a rather important place in Alberta, right? In its history and in, you know, how we talk about what Alberta is, right? Um, but in, in, in Unamagi, Cape Breton, in Nova Scotia, the, the, the hegemonic kind of culture, the group is the Scottish, right? So Ukrainians are a minority yet in a different way. And in solidarity, I would say in Whitney Pier, with uh, many other minority, minoritized and marginalized groups. Um, it's not to say, of course, that, you know, this, this is clearly not the same thing as indigenous groups, right? Or racialized groups like, like uh, um, African Nova Scotians or uh, Black Cape Bretoners. But I would say that in my observation, there is a solidarity here. And I would say that the activities that are going on now um, certainly speak to that. And, and as you know, as an historian, that the labor movement and the cooperative house movement, like this is the, this is the place in Canada where so much of that was so strong for, for so long in the early 1900s, especially. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think those those regional differences also get flattened in general in our in our history because there's so much focus on the prairies, um, and then the sort of as the kind of cultural center of Ukrainian Canadian life, and then Ontario as the political center. And in some ways, like fair enough, but in other ways, right, it, it does a disservice to to kind of the again that diversity of our experiences and the way that different parts of the community might engage with different topics. And I know that this is something that the kind of contemporary political community struggles with a little bit of trying to figure out how to position itself and how to position the causes that it advocates for in a way that is the most inclusive 
and you know brings together the most Ukrainians, right? Because this diversity has been not talked about for so long and ignored for so long and not understood for so long. So yeah, for sure, I I buy that a hundred percent. Um, Whitney Pier is in Enemy Alien, so if you're you can see it drawn on the pages. <laughs> Did you have a comment? No, no. Any, no. Were there questions there online, Cassandra? Oh, I can't see that. Yeah, there's a question from Shauna. Yeah. Shauna. Hi there. Thank you, Cassandra. Beautiful uh, presentation. I guess speaking of these, um, the flattening of the narrative, one of the things that I'm really interested in, not just with these communities, but all communities is, the tensions between um, the historical narrative and the historical record and public memory or public history. And so you mentioned that a little bit, I think, in talking about redress and sort of the way narratives got told in order to achieve certain strategic aims. And so I guess I would just love to hear you talk about anything that you've, um, where where that tension or that question about that tension takes you in terms of thinking about how we tell these stories in the present um, in relationship to what uh, you know what happened in the past and and you know how we do flatten them or not depending on the strategy that we might be going for. Yeah, that's a great question. I think as a community member who is obviously interested in having this historical injustice recognized in some capacity, I understand uh, and I'm fine with this, right? Like public history can be very nuanced, but it doesn't always have to be necessarily, particularly when it's around a campaign um, as opposed to just like education work. So as a community member, like I, again, I tried to, I try to be sympathetic to that. Um, more recently, historians have tried to unpack narratives like that a little bit more um, and have kind of tried to grapple with what our role is in correcting those narratives and how to do that in a way because again it's sort of one thing to say like well that narrative is ridiculous and in fact it's so much more complicated and then you write like a 600 page book that five academics read and then you know the narrative goes on in the community and like you sit in your you know office proud of yourself um so like trying to figure out what the role of historians is, is in intervening in those narratives within the community and trying to um find some sort of place to kind of like latch on to and find some common ground with and, and like bridge those identities and so you know enemy alien is a graphic history for that reason because I wanted to intervene and I wanted to tell a more complicated story of internment and I wanted to talk about the politics of internment. I wasn't grappling with redress, but I was trying to set the scene for us to think about, again, these systemic issues, um, but I wanted to do it in a way that my community would actually read it. And so <laughs> like that, that's how I've been grappling with this um, and other historians do that differently and other people do that differently. But, you know, I think it's tough because you like you don't want to be sour grapes and like you don't want to be the person who's like, well, actually, but it's important, right, that that we try to not even just to like correct things, but just to always be learning more about these events. Like there's always more to learn, like even in my even in my work on internment where I'm trying to kind of complicate the narrative, I'm learning all these other interesting things about internment that I just didn't, wouldn't have known otherwise and that other people didn't find because every person in every generation does their own research and finds their own things. So there's all sorts of benefits to that. But yeah, specifically, I've been grappling with it by trying to do work that my community will engage with and that isn't just like some, you know, giant book that no one's ever going to read because it's not interesting so love that answer thank you oh there's a question from valerie i'm trying to determine are you doing research in cape breton right now i'm not are you are you somewhere else in canada so I'm in Halifax right now, but um, I'm Thank currently. You too. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not currently uh, working on anything to do with the camps in, in Nova Scotia, just because I've I've got to get a few other things off my plate, but uh, eventually I'd like to I'd like to return to that um, enemy alien because the protagonist ends up in the Dosco. He, he ends up working for Dosco. There's a little bit of Nova Scotia content, but that's kind of my only dabble. Right, okay. Val Valerie, this project um, in this project that we're working on with the festival now, um, Cassandra is is a part of it. She's a collaborator. And as I was in the, in the introduction, I was saying we are working on wooing her to Sydney to work with us more. So um, that's the that's part of the aim here. Well, I, I can tell that she's an intelligent and wise woman. So to migrate to Cape Breton would be an excellent idea. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be there. Uh, that's it for online. Any other questions here from the floor? Father Roman has another. There's a saying that history is written by victors, by the victors. Uh, with the passing of time and the, the internment camp for 100 years ago, how do you continue to come up with new data with the people already who were there have passed away or no longer available? Uh, what are the challenges in that type of research? It's really hard. It's really hard. Um, there was a long time where I thought that everything that could be said about internment had basically been said. Um, but it's trying to find clever workarounds for some of the limitations we have. So, um, you know, national, federal, mainstream archives have been picked over pretty well. There's always room for new interpretations there. Um, but one of the things that I did was because I was getting, because I was getting interested specifically in the political affiliations of internees, I went back into the community and went to uh, the archive holders of uh the left-wing outfits, the Ukrainian Canadian left-wing outfits. And I said, hey, do you have anything? And folks happen to have things. So that was a clever workaround. Whereas the kind of generation of redress activists would not have gone to those archives for ideological reasons. I was, I had no problem, you know, opening those doors and asking those questions there. And I was able to find things as a result. Um, Another sort of just fluke moment was I'm, I was working for my PhD thesis. I look at uh, Ukrainians during the Cold War, um, and I'm specifically interested in manifestations of anti-communism. And I was working in an archive of one of Canada's most prolific Cold Warriors, Watson Kirkconnell, uh, who oh, yeah. was the president of Acadia University. Yeah, right. so I hear. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so I, I work a lot on Watson Kirkconnell and uh, in his archives in, in Wolfville, um, I remember that he had been a camp guard. And uh, I just started poking around in some of his earlier files and found things like that as well. So other historians who are much more clever than me uh, will find things like the people will just make connections and find things. I mean, I think eventually we will run out of information um, and we will run out of things. Um, you know, we don't have any, we can't do any oral history. Um, you know, people might find things, but, but again, I think eventually, right? Um, we'll have to sort of probably put this topic to rest. But again, at the same time, you know, I, I just was thinking of um, Sarah Bouillot, who's an archeologist. She does conflict archeology span and she's been um, using ground penetrating radar uh, to investigate the different campsites. And she's found all sorts of just fascinating things, um, different artifacts, but also she's able to tell us a little bit more about the physical camps themselves. So there's all sorts of creative ways that academics and scholars and activists and those interested in these topics will find ways to tell this story. So. Yeah. As, since 1991, when Ukraine became independent, 1991, and the archives opened up, uh, is that, could that be a source of additional information, family histories, things like that? Uh, but in Ukraine, you view uh, the university there? Probably not, but it's certainly possible. Um, it could be something 
folks explore in the future. My guess is that that would probably not be fruitful, but um, definitely archives in um, in Britain would be useful. Um, they held on one of the ways that the kind of first generation of, of historians were able to get at this topic was by actually looking at the original records that were transferred and held in, in Britain, whereas the Canadian records were inaccessible to them. So there is potential to look internationally at different sources to find things. Um, my sense is that the migration records coming out of Ukraine would not be sufficient enough to tell these stories. Um, but again, I could, I, I'm happy to be proven wrong on that, so. You know, Cassandra, I'm struck by the juxtaposition um, because I've been doing research on uh, Byzantine Ukrainian liturgical chant recently um, and ways in which it's connected to what was happening or, you know, before it was coming over with people in the early 1900s. And I'm struck by the juxtaposition of in early 1900s on what is now Ukraine, the agitators and the ad activists were, you know, Ukrainian nationalists, right? They were, uh, they were working against, in fact, the Soviets, the leftists. And on Canadian soil, the Ukrainian agitators were, you know, the leftists, in fact, right? It's an interesting juxtaposition. I mean, there's so much to think about. Um, I, I just have to say how delighted I am that you were able to share with us, uh, you know, some of your learnings today. And as others have mentioned, we really look forward to learning more from and with you in the future. Um, this was a really fantastic kind of final talk. <laughs> um, it really is, does open up more questions, right? And, and gets us inspired to to continue our work. Many of the uh, parish community members are involved in an exhibit creation process. Um, so that will continue after this festival of learning. Um, and you're going to be part of that, which we're very grateful for. Um, and uh, the re there's a reconciliation process ongoing that involves uh, filmmaking. Um, but I did want to acknowledge, you know, all of the parish members who've given so much of their time, uh, and their efforts to these events so far. I mean, Stanley White is here. He's been here to make sure that we can get into the hall every Wednesday and Thursday night for workshops and talks. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge that there is a one research assistant, a community-based research assistant, Alex Oreschuk, who's here. Um, he will continue with the exhibit creation process. Uh, but I, I'd like to also say goodbye and good night to a research assistant whose name is Danielle. Um, and she's been with us to support this community engagement process. Tonight's her last night, so I'd like to give her a hand. Um, and then um, I'd like to just uh, make sure you have the floor, Cassandra, if there's any other final comments you'd like to make before we thank you for your contribution tonight. No, no, thanks for having me. It was uh, really great to be here and I look forward to participating in the future and hopefully being there in person. <laughs> we thank you. Thanks, Cassandra, and to the audience. Bye. Bye.